So this story takes place when I was about 16 years old. At my school, I played for the volleyball team, and every year we would go to a camp and do volunteer work for this guy. The camp was in the middle of nowhere. When we got to the camp, we immediately started to work until 8pm. This was around October, so it was already dark at 8. My two friends and I were sitting around the fire, trying to figure out something we could do so we weren't so bored. We heard that there was a small river down the hill from the camp, and we thought we could check it out. The problem was, is that it was some guy's property, and the owner of the camp told us to not disturb him since the guy was a little strange. We weren't really supposed to leave the camp, but being 16 years old, we loved breaking the rules. We walked about 10 minutes from the camp and finally reached the river. It was bigger than we expected, and there was a large wooden bridge that crossed it. The bridge was about 20 feet long and was big enough to let a truck go over it. My two friends and I decided to go under the bridge and check it out. As we were walking by the shoreline, we saw two headlights off in the distance moving towards the bridge, so we bolted underneath it and hid. We then heard the truck roll over our heads and to the other side. My friends and I chilled there for a while, just talking and throwing rocks in the water. It was about 8.30 at this time, and now it was pretty much pitch black. That's when we started to hear a slow rumble in the distance. The same truck had come back, and this time it was moving much slower. We stayed put under the bridge, stifling our laughter. Eventually, the truck moved over the bridge, but rather than going over to the other side, the truck stopped right on top of us. The only thing you could hear was the rushing water and the hum of the engine. Then, the door of the truck swung open, and out came a loud thump on top of the bridge. Then we heard a loud scream, saying, I know you're out there! I'm gonna find you! I looked at my friends, and they were both shaking in fear. This must have been the crazy property owner, and he seemed pissed that we were on his land. He started screaming and saying he was gonna hurt us if he finds us. We could see that he had a flashlight, and he was swinging it around looking for us. We heard loud thumps as he walked around a little bit, calling out for us, and thank God he never went under the bridge. Eventually, it went silent, and it sounded as if he went back into his truck. I was too terrified to move. We sat there for about ten minutes, and then my one friend, who we'll call Trevor, whispered in my ear, saying that we have to go. I gave him a quick nod, and in slow motion we moved out from under the bridge. We started to army crawl on the shoreline of the river, and I remember looking behind me to see the top of the bridge. I saw a white board F-150. In the driver's seat was the man, staring right at me with a sinister smile, and he even gave me a little wave. At that moment I screamed and ran. My friend saw me run and took off after me. I could hear screaming from behind us. I took a quick glance behind me and saw that he was chasing after us and I couldn't quite make out the object in his hand, but it seemed to be a weapon of some sort. We ran into the forest and ducked behind a bush. It was pitch black in the forest and we couldn't hear a thing. We sat there for a while, just shaking. The man never walked by us and we never heard him. After we gathered our courage, we got up and walked back to camp, got into our tents and tried to fall asleep. The next morning we talked to the camp owner about the man that owned the property of the river. The camp owner said that he didn't know much about the man, but he knows that he has some mental problems and he'd been accused of assault. I am so happy that we were able to escape from underneath the bridge. I can't imagine what would have happened if he caught us. This happened in 2009. We would fly from our home state in California to Minnesota to visit my father's family for the summer. I've always enjoyed it there because of the nature and peaceful atmosphere. My father's family lived far from the nearest town and he only had two neighbors. My only friend there was a girl who lived next door. Let's call her Morgan. She's around my age and me, my sister, and her would always play from sunrise to sunset. One day at around 4 p.m., we were outside playing badminton. 
My sister hit the birdie too hard, and it landed in the next door neighbor's yard. Morgan said she had more inside her house and went to get them. I felt uncomfortable leaving it there, so I told my sister I'll go get it myself. She told me not to do it and just wait for Morgan. While my sister was fixing the net, I decided to run and get it real quick. As I was about to enter the gate, my sister grabbed me from behind and began telling me how much of a bad idea it was. That's when an old man came out from behind the house. He picked up the birdie and said, Is this yours? I said yes and asked if I could have it back. He said he had his grandchildren's old toys upstairs and asked if we wanted to have them. Me and my sister were very young at the time and we thought as he lived so close and he looked like a typical sweet grandfather, what's the worst that could happen? So we agreed and entered through the back door. The first thing I noticed was the stench. It smelled of damp and rotting food. I shrugged it off at the time since he was old. Maybe he lived alone. We heard Morgan calling our names and we politely told the old man that we had to go and maybe we'd return tomorrow. Morgan saw us through the window and immediately asked what we were doing there. I answered, The sweet old man? And she cut me off and said that the house was abandoned since she moved there. I thought she was just playing around with me and told her to cut it out. She had a blank expression and that's when I knew that she was serious. We never told anyone because we didn't want to cause any trouble. But now that I'm older, I wonder if it was some ghost or creepy old man luring kids into that house. The house got demolished recently, which is why I wanted to share this story. It was a cold, foggy evening when I contacted a close friend of mine to stay at my place for the night. Both of us were only 10 years old at the time and my parents were often at work until midnight, so I was usually alone with nothing to do except watching a television show or reading a book. My friend Alex had agreed to come over and brought a game of Monopoly to pass some of the time. I also asked if he was interested in going to explore an abandoned subway station three miles away. He seemed excited at first, so we planned to go on the trip in the morning. I remembered that the subway dated back to the mid-1920s and became abandoned in 1932 after the market crash in 1929. I was very fascinated about its history but never got the chance to go inside after my parents had warned me not to enter. As I quietly slept in my bed, I heard what sounded like a gunshot coming from the forest behind the house. Both of us woke up frightened after what we had heard, and I told my friend not to worry as hunters tend to go into the forest on frequent occasions, but when I checked the time, it was 11.39pm. This seemed very unusual as hunters only came into the forest between 8pm and 10pm. I looked at Alex and decided to get out of my bed, intending to look through the window and spot for anyone in the forest. The darkness clouded my vision so I was unable to see anyone in the forest. I turned around and looked at Alex again, when suddenly I heard the front door squeak open. Chills went down my spine. Both of us quietly moved to the bathroom, locked the door, and kept the light off. It was the only safe place in the house. Both of us were terrified as we desperately tried to keep as calm as we could. We heard footsteps getting louder and louder until they stopped in front of the bathroom door. And then this is when the most terrifying sound forced my heart to almost burst. Both of us screamed as the person chopped the door to pieces. It was pitch black inside the room, making it hard to find the vent, and by the time I spotted the vent, the person behind the door had made a hole big enough for us to see him. The man adorned black leather and was wearing a plague doctor mask. I scurried back to the vent, but it was too high above the floor for us to reach it. So Alex told me to go first because he was the strongest. He lifted me up on his shoulders, allowing me to open the vent and crawl inside. When I looked at the door again, the man had managed to fit his arm through the hole and reached for the lock. I quickly grabbed Alex's hand, but struggled to pull him up into the vent. Alex! I shouted and began going after him. I pursued the figure until I was led to the abandoned subway deep within the forest. It was chilly and foggy meaning that I could only see objects within a range of five or six yards. 
Inside the subway was a pool of freezing cold water. It was so dark that I couldn't see anything. I had to rely on listening to the screams from Alex and track the source. As I slowly walked through the subway, I was now struggling to breathe under the intense stress and fear of the situation. Alex! I called, but there was no response. I continued walking through the water until the exit was no longer visible. I was now experiencing a massive panic attack. I had lost track of Alex, and I had no idea where I was or how to get out. Where are you, Alex? Back when I was in college, me and my best friend Miko heard a rumor that her dormitory was haunted. I didn't encounter anything in the two years of staying there, so I was skeptical. I could see why the rumor started. Our dorm was kind of creepy, and Miko was convinced it was true. One day, I placed a hot cup of coffee in the sink and said, If this cup magically empties itself by the time we get back from school, I'll believe you. Deal. Wanna bet on it? Come on, you won't bet on it because you know you'll lose. When I arrived home, I noticed Miko was asleep. It seemed quite weird as he would normally be playing games or cooking in the kitchen. I put my bag on the table and noticed the cup in the sink. <laughs> I knew it, I said to myself. I started to pour the coffee away when my phone vibrated. Why are you calling me? I thought perhaps he left his phone at school. I answered. Hello? Hey, just eat without me tonight if you're hungry. I'm still at the store getting food supplies for next week. I grabbed some coffee I noticed we're almost out. Oh, and I tried looking for that green sauce you put in your homemade burgers. No luck though. But... Wait, another checkout just opened. I'll cook tonight. I shouldn't be too long. See ya. I was confused. My eyes darted around the room as I tried to gather my thoughts. That's when I realized something. I was too freaked out at this point. No! No! Hey, I hope you're hungry. Oh. It was an early morning. My campus didn't offer housing and I lived about a half a mile from school, so I started my journey as usual while playing on my phone. I glanced up to see an old man heading towards me on a bicycle. Normally, I'd step aside to let bikers and skaters pass, but he braked instead. I stopped too, wondering if there was something wrong. He walked up to me and said, Don't worry, I'm not gonna hurt you. I felt chills instantly. I didn't know what to think. I just looked up at him with a fearful and confused expression. I was gathering up the courage to tell him that I was late for class and I should go, but before I could say anything, he said, Get off the grass! Looking down, I noticed I had stepped over towards the road and onto the grass. I stepped off slowly and he said, You wouldn't want to step on any bugs or get your shoes dirty now, would you? He raised his finger and asked me what my name was. I told him, and he replied, Don't worry, I'm not gonna hurt you. The same chills ran through my body again, but before I could say anything, the man said, Get off the grass! You wouldn't want to step on any bugs or get your shoes dirty now, would you? I looked down to see that I was back on the edge of the sidewalk again. This had to be deja vu. He asked for my name once more. 
I said my name again, but he interrupted me before I could finish. He told me his grandchildren are down the road and needed gas money. I told him I didn't have any spare change or any change at all for that matter. He continued to ask me again and I gave him the same answer. Eventually, I headed towards my school. I turned to see if he was still there, but he was gone. As I was walking, I approached the intersection. There was a truck on its side. It must have tipped over while turning the corner. I was 26 years old, and I was unemployed. Feeling unfulfilled by the monotony of a job life, I decided I would try my hand at working from home, so my days and nights comprised me of surfing the internet for any jobs I could get. I was a big procrastinator, so more often than not I'd stray away and waste time doing other things. One day, I came across talk about the deep web while on Reddit. I felt amused by the people talking about it as if it was something so scary, and decided I'd look into it. It was stupid of me to go on it in the first place, but I made it even sillier by deciding to check it out late at night. It was about 2am and I came across a website where you could chat with someone anonymously. The person I got was a woman. She was in her early 20s and very pretty. She sat with her head in her hands, looking playful into the webcam while batting her eyes. I had no desire to turn my camera on and started our chat, thinking that while I didn't come across anything scary, I could befriend this pretty girl. It sounded like a better deal anyway. She told me to turn the camera on, but I ignored that request and tried to get her to talk. She finally did after some prodding, but I noticed how guarded she was. I also noticed how after every message I sent, her eyes would look off camera, either to her side or somewhere behind her computer. After a while, it started getting annoying, so I asked her if someone else was there with her. I want to see you first, she said. Up until now, I'd been chatting while she'd answered my questions verbally. I'm not that curious. Don't be scared, she said <laughs> laughing this time looking behind the laptop again and making a face that seemed to indicate she was laughing at my expense with someone else. <sighs> this is getting boring. It feels like I'm not just talking to you. That's because you're not. You're talking to all of us. Who else is there? Turn your camera on. Is this a joke? Turn it on. Okay, I'll be leaving now. Turn on the camera. Her laughter was almost piercing by now. There was nothing humorous about the situation, yet she threw her head back with riotous laughter. I'd had enough and moved the cursor over to turn the chat box off when I saw the cursor had jammed. The only thing that was working was the chat box, and I still had access to the keyboard. Turn the camera on, sweetie. Her gumdrop-filled voice was louder than before when I moved my gaze up to see her smiling toothfully at the camera. Her face still beautiful, but the smile completely fake. My computer's crashed, I can't see the screen. Sorry. I lied. I didn't want her to know I had no option but to chat. Her screen flashed before going blank. There was nothing there but a black screen. I felt relieved, thinking that at least I didn't need to talk to her while I tried to figure out what happened to the screen. Just then, a chat message popped up. Open the damn camera, you... The aggressiveness in the message frightened me. Now, the fact that I couldn't see her face while she typed this made me feel nervous. I didn't dare reply back, but then the cursor moved. I watched shell-shocked as the cursor twirled around the screen. Open the camera now. I still didn't make a move. There was no way anything good would be waiting for me if I did what she asked. The screen began flickering as if a virus was causing the computer to writhe in agony. Do you want me to find you? My heart raced. Could it be possible she knew where I was? I started typing. Please stop bothering me. Then turn on the f***ing camera.
By this point, I thought she was some kind of sadist who got her kicks by scaring unassuming people in chat rooms. So I obliged and turned the webcam on. I saw my frightened face staring into the screen. Judging by my face, my attempts at looking tough were painfully unsuccessful. I asked around for the girl looking straight into the camera, telling her I did what she wanted and to stop hacking into my computer. There were several seconds of silence. I kept my stare directed to the little box that showed her camera feed, but it was pitch black. I motioned into the camera in confusion, feeling as if she was messing with me now. Then I saw another message. Look here. After a few seconds of staring at those words, I looked back at her camera, but my computer instantly malfunctioned, and I received another message. Look here. Don't look up. The chat was filled with nonsensical gibberish. She typed with such ferocious speed, my screen whirled away with her constant messages. I couldn't understand what was going on, but I didn't look up. My patience ran thin, and I wrote back. What is this supposed to mean? Her response came. I read only the letters in bold and shuddered. I looked back into her webcam, and I fell back into my chair my eyes widening. She was back there, only her face looked completely demented. She had a savage expression, devoid of emotion, but her eyes were almost popping out of their sockets, and she was huffing as if she had extreme amounts of pent-up rage. The way she looked directly into the camera made me feel she despised me with all of her being. There was no amusement there anymore. Her camera went blank again. Then the chat popped up. My heart stopped again. For a split second, there had been the same blackness, only for the lights to come back on. She wasn't alone anymore. There was a man next to her with a black mask on. He made no movements other than look into the camera like the girl. The girl's neck creaked to her side. It looked like it was causing her pain. And then the lights went out again. The chat resumed. This time, I screamed in fright and fell off my chair. There was another man with them now. He was standing next to the girl with the original one on the other side. This man had the same mask on, but his hands were grasping the girl's shoulders. Even with the subpar quality of the webcam, I could see the force with which the man dug his hands into the girl. It looked like he could rip her in two. The girl, however had a huge grin on her face. Her eyes were mad with glee, or so it looked. Her teeth were perfectly lined up as her mouth spread into that toothy grin, but I could see she was in pain. Even with the smallest sign of her smile fading, the man clenched his hands even tighter than before, which made her smile even wider. All three of them were shaking, as if it was extremely cold where they were. After a couple seconds, I realized they were shuddering, like trying to hold back laughter. What are you laughing at? I yelled into the screen. They didn't answer, and continued to tremor with concealed hilarity. What is so damn funny? I bellowed. They stopped shaking. Within a couple seconds, the screen went black again. When it turned back on, the man no longer grasped the girl's shoulder. Neither was she smiling. All three pointed into the camera. Upon a closer look, I understood that they weren't pointing at me. They were pointing behind me. I didn't need to look back, I could see myself in the webcam. There was someone peeking from behind me. It was another man in a mask, and according to what I saw in my webcam, he was with me in my room, right behind me. I turned around quickly, but saw nothing where I had seen him in the webcam. I turned back towards the screen and, to my bewilderment, saw a third man in the girl's chat box. It was the same man I had just seen standing in my room. Now, all three had their hands on the girl and were gripping tight. The girl wasn't laughing anymore. She had a look of utter devastation. A tear was dropping from her eye but it wasn't just a tear. It was blood trickling down her eye socket. 
She then mouthed the words, help me, and the next second she screamed as if her lungs were being ripped off as the screen went black. I immediately got up and pulled the plug out of my computer and backed out of the room. For a couple seconds, I swear I heard her screams even though the computer was unplugged. The room went quiet, but I was too devastated to stay there and ran out of my house despite it being 3 a.m. I caught a cab and went over to my friends, who had to talk me down for an hour before I could be calmed. I returned back to my house with my friend a day later. Everything was the same, and after thoroughly checking around the house, we concluded that there was no one there, nor was there a sign of anyone ever having broken in. I've never gone back to the deep web. My friend suggested it might have been some prank by computer hackers, but the way that girl shrieked, the terror she had on her face, it convinced me she had been a victim herself. I had wondered if I had stayed on for longer, if I would have become a victim too. Could those men have found me? Was there really someone in the room with me? There was nothing I could do, because there was nothing concrete to report to the police. What I did do was throw the computer out and buy a new one. There was no way I could even open it back up after what happened. During my holiday, I spent about three weeks in Japan. I arrived pretty late, so I couldn't check into the hotel that I initially booked, so I booked the cheapest hotel that I could find nearby. Aesthetically, it was quite nice, but it did have easy access to the building, meaning anyone could come in and go to any room as they please. Plus, there was no security in sight. After arriving in my room, I ordered some food and watched some TV. I was still pretty jet-lagged from the flight, so I started to get ready for bed. As I was falling asleep, I felt the urge to double-check the door just to see if it was locked. I didn't think anything was going to happen, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. About five minutes after I checked the door, I heard footsteps outside. Initially, I thought it was someone leaving their room, but the footsteps started to pick up speed. The sounds started getting louder and louder and I started to freak out a little. All of a sudden, the sound stopped. I looked at the light shining through the bottom of my door, and there was a shadow of a person. At first, I thought it was room service, but it was too late for that. Or maybe it was some drunk idiot who was at the wrong room. As soon as I switched my light on, the shadow disappeared. I was confused, but I reluctantly went back to bed. That's when I suddenly heard scratching coming from my door so I immediately turned my light on and shouted, Who's there? After a moment of silence, I heard the footsteps slowly fade away. At this point, I was thinking it could be some kids messing around, so I got up, opened the door, and peeked my head outside. I glanced in both directions down the dark and slim hallways. That's when my heart stopped. A man emerged from the darkness and ran erratically towards me. His face was contorted as he screamed, and I could see he was holding a knife in his right hand. As he got closer, I could see him more clearly. He had disgusting long, dirty hair, his clothes were ripped, and he had cuts and bruises all over. I quickly slammed my door and pressed against it, praying that the man would just go away. After what felt like hours, I finally gathered my courage and looked through the peephole. He was gone. I let out a sigh of relief and checked the peephole again. My heart started pumping faster than ever before. He was right in front of the door. He was wearing a maniacal smile on his face, and all of a sudden he raised his knife and yelled, I'm gonna fucking kill you! I jumped back and kept my eyes locked on the bottom of the door as I backed up to my bed. I grabbed my phone and started dialing the police. As I raised the phone to my ear, I saw that the shadow was gone. When the police arrived, I tried to explain what happened, and they checked the security cameras. They almost immediately recognized the man. He had been doing this to people for a while now, and the police had been trying to track him down for months. 
After a long night of no sleep, I finally arrived at the right hotel that I had booked initially in Tokyo. That creepy guy was still on my mind, but I thought the chances of him being here were pretty slim so I didn't bother locking my door that night. At 12.05 AM I woke up to a big bang next to me. I turned around to see the same guy passed out on the floor with a knife in hand. I was in shock. How did he find me? I quickly ran out of the room and locked him inside. The cops came and he was finally arrested. Let's just say I'm always going to be locking my doors from now on. It was November of 2006. I was a 16-year-old kid living in the town of Altoona, Iowa. I went to bed early one night because I had to work the early shift at McDonald's. As I slept, I had a dream that I was running through downtown Des Moines, but I wasn't on a jog. I was running from something. As I ran around the corner of a building, I came face to face with my pursuer. A tall man wearing a trench coat and a top hat stood in front of me. The only thing visible of his face was his eyes. They were abnormally large with black pupils, and it looked at me as if it wanted something. After what felt like hours, he reached out his bony hand, as if he wanted me to go with him. I woke up violently from my dream, and after catching my breath, I peered around my room to see if I was safe. As I stood up from my bed, I noticed that I could see my breath. Feeling confused, I checked my window. It was latched shut. I then walked over and checked my vent. I could still feel warm air coming from it. As I sat back down on my bed, I tried to figure out what exactly was going on. That's when the figure from my dream appeared at the foot of my bed. I scrambled back to my headboard. What do you want? I asked, trying to hide the shakiness in my voice. With the same bony finger, it pointed at me. Growing up in a religious home, I believed what I was looking at was a demon. I told the creature to leave. It just waved its finger at me, and with a low voice, it spoke to me. Never leave. Always here. The creature then screamed loudly and disappeared. A feeling of nausea came over me and I vomited on my floor. The last thing I remember was cleaning myself up and waking up to my alarm. It's been about a month since I had seen the top hat wearing man in my bedroom. The Christmas season was in full effect. My parents weren't home because they got invited to some kind of event. So it was only me and my three sisters at home. I had to wake up early in the morning for work so I decided to go to sleep. I rested my head on my pillow and closed my eyes. Not even 30 seconds passed until my sisters burst into my room and started singing obnoxious songs. This of course made me very angry, but I thought if I ignored them that they would leave me alone. This was not the case. As I pulled the blankets over my head, I started to feel the same cold feeling that I had in November. As the obnoxious singing subsided, I lowered the blanket below my eyes and saw the man standing in the corner of my room. In one swift motion, he charged towards me, and I blacked out. When I finally came to, I found that my sisters had locked themselves inside the bathroom. As I knocked on the door, they told me to go away. I asked them what happened, and all they could say was mom and dad were on their way home. I looked down and saw that my hand was slightly bloody. Holes were in the bathroom door, and a broom was sticking out of the wall. I then walked into the living room and found that there were knives stuck into the wall as well. The same wave of nausea passed over me, just like in November, and I threw up again. As I was cleaning up, my parents walked through the door. My father immediately walked over to me and gave me a good beating, then he sent me to my room. I went to bed crying. Not from the beating, 
I was crying because of the confusion. I had no idea what was going on. The next morning, my sisters reluctantly sat next to me and told me what had happened. They said I got angry and chased them down and tried to hurt them. They said my eyes were red to the point where they thought I was bleeding from them. They said I sounded like a different person. In 2011, that was the last time I saw the top hat wearing man. I'd just moved into a new apartment and after a long stressful day of unpacking, I took a shower and got ready for bed. As I started to drift off, I could feel that cold feeling again. I lifted my head and saw the man standing in front of me. The man's eyes were red now. With a low voice, just like on that November night, it looked at me and said, Never leave. Always here. This happened when I was 17 years old. I would go to the gym three to four times a week and ride the bus home. It was a Sunday and I had just missed my bus, so I had to wait longer for another one. I would have called my parents, but they were out for the evening, and taxis charged more, so I decided to sit and wait in the bus shelter. It was a cold night and snow had just started peppering the ground. My bus was taking longer than usual, so I got my phone out and listened to some music. Almost an hour had passed. It was freezing and I hadn't seen anyone at all. That was until I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was a creepy guy dressed in thick layers of clothing, walking slowly towards me. I knew staring at him would draw more attention so I just focused on my phone. He sat down at the other end of the shelter and just stared at me. There was something off about him. He seemed like he was either drunk or on drugs. He then asked, What does the boss do? I took out my earphones and said, I think it's delayed because of the snow. He stared at me for a while then started mumbling to himself. He was really starting to creep me out so I pretended to be on my phone. After a couple of minutes I took another look. He moved closer to me. I looked away for a second then heard the sound of him sliding even closer. I turned to him and said, You okay there? He stared at me with glossy eyes, lifted his arm and leaned towards me. Immediately, I grabbed my bag and ran as he fell to the ground. I ran down the road trying my hardest not to look back. I kept going until I got to the next bus stop. I turned around to check to see if he was there. He was gone so I went to sit down. Feeling relieved, I rested my head on the back of the glass and waited for the bus. I jolted and turned around to see the same guy staring at me through the glass. What the hell is wrong with you? Then he started walking around the shelter towards me. I'm warning you, stay back! I yelled in panic as I was backing up. I wanted to run but I left my bag in the shelter and I couldn't leave without it. Suddenly, the man leaped at me and I quickly moved out of the way. He fell to the ground face first. I froze in shock then noticed the blood coming from his face. I tried to get a response out of him but nothing worked. I called the police and paramedics and they arrived shortly after. I told them what had happened and they told me that the guy was on prescription drugs. They found a photo in his wallet of him and his son. The boy looked just like me so we assumed he thought I was him. I later learned that he had lost his son in a custody battle and went off the rails. He was taken away for treatment, and that was the last I saw of him. I got my driver's license shortly after, and have never been on a bus since. <laughs>